Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our October 18 City Council meeting. I have a short statement I'd like to read, and uh, then we'll get into our uh, meeting. We grieve with our Wesleyan community this evening, following last Friday's loss of one of their own 21-year-old Garrett Siege. The details of this tragedy are insignificant. What is important is to recognize the reality that we are experiencing an epidemic of suicide in our American society. We are on pace to lose 50,000 Americans to suicide in 2018. Since 1999 alone, suicide rates in the U.S. have skyrocketed by 30 percent. Rurally located Americans are far more vulnerable to suicide. West Virginia is one of the states that has seen the greatest increase in suicide during the past 20 years. 54 percent of people who take their own lives didn't have a previously known mental health issue. Males are four times more likely to take their own lives than females. Suicide for whites are higher and have been climbing faster than those for other racial and ethnic groups. Suicide is the second leading cause of death for people between 10 to 24 years of age. Gay youths are 300% more likely to attempt suicide. As reported by the Trevor Project, citing the Center for Disease Control, one in six high school students seriously considered suicide during the preceding year. The CDC cites several different approaches to reduce suicide rates, such as working to stabilize housing, employment, and teaching coping and problem-solving skills early in life. Research shows that the decision to attempt suicide is often made quickly in an impulsive <coughs> way, says Dr. Robert Jebbia, the head of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Jebbia observes that our nation currently has no federally funded suicide prevention program for adults. There are some for youth, but they're very, very tiny. We can't expect a major health problem like this to be addressed unless we see the investment. According to the BBC, they recently studied and reported about suicide in the United States, citing Professor Julie Sorrell, president of the American Association of Suicidology, a major problem with suicide prevention stems from our mental health systems. She, said, she writes, our mental health systems are just really struggling across the country. In terms of training mental health professionals, we're not doing a great job. Dr. Jerry Reed with the National Action Alliance for Suicide Prevention states, there is definitely a relationship between serious mental illness and suicidal behavior. However, it is not just a mental health challenge. Economic conditions or livelihood opportunities in decline lead people to positions where they are at risk. We need to intervene in both mental and public health cases, according to Dr. Reed. Encouraging people to go to therapy and using mental health professionals to help change dysfunctional thinking is the ultimate goal. For some people, feeling connected and feeling like they belong, like they are part of something, are really important things, according to the CDC. Many people who contemplate, attempt, or carry out suicide feel hopeless. They're in a state of despair, whether it's finances, relationships, or health. The June 15, 2018 issue of The Economist refers to many of today's suicide victims as being, quote unquote, the new hopeless. Somehow, somewhat, our society needs to create hope. If you or someone you know is having suicidal thoughts, there is help. Naturally, if there's an emergency, call 911. But other resources to help people deal with depression, anxiety, a sense of hopelessness include the U.S. National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-8255 or the Crisis Test Line by texting HOME, H-O-M-E, to 741741. Youth in need of help can call Kids Helpline at 1-800-668-6868. Signs that a person may be suicidal include a change in behavior or the presence of entirely new behaviors, often born out of a painful event, loss, or change. Most people who take their lives exhibit one or more warning signs through what they say or do. Be alert to new impulsive conduct. 
every day, every single day in towns across America, towns often just like our Buchanan, 140 people will commit suicide. Suicide occurs all around us. Suicide occurs here. Please recognize the signs. Help anyone who talks about killing themselves, who expresses hopelessness, who say they have no reason to live, who say they are a burden to others, who say they feel trapped or are suffering unbearable pain, depression, or anxiety. Err on the side of intervening. Dare to kill. I'd also ask before we have our moment of silence, and we received word earlier this afternoon that uh, former Mayor Jim Noor is in uh, critical condition uh, in the hospital and uh, we may be talking a matter of hours uh, that he has his time left with us. I would ask that you uh, keep Mayor Noor and his family in our best thoughts, wishes, and prayers this evening. Thank you very much. Mr. Rob Hinton, would you be so kind as to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. It's great having you all here. Council, if you would indulge me for just a moment, I would uh, like to jump down to one strategic matter. Uh, gosh, if I can find it on here. Uh, did Teresa already take it off? Andy? I'm not seeing it. Gosh. Oh, here it is, F2. Uh, we had talked about this a couple of meetings ago, that the city is going to establish, uh, it might end up being a monthly or every other month kind of a thing, but we are gonna honor uh, those contributors who volunteer their time, people uh, who perform community service for us in so many ways. Council, I would entertain a motion that we establish this award. So moved. I have a motion by Mr. Rylands. I have a second to his motion. Mr. Rigger has seconded the motion. Is there any discussion on the motion? Hearing of the need for none, I'll call for the question. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, like sign. So now, one of those things that uh, I get to do, this my oral stuff. <clears throat> Amanda's been putting off being recognized for a couple of council meetings. Um, her intention, as many of you know, was to have already left the record Delta and move on to her next chapter in life. And uh, she's uh, currently still sticking around and still, I think she's just gonna end up being the, the, the owner of the company or something maybe. But Amanda Hayes, would you come forth and join me up front here? Okay, this is a proclamation. Whereas the Council of the City of Buchanan resolved during its regular meeting of October 18, 2018, to honor from time to time residents of our Buchanan Upshur community who perform extraordinary service while embracing the kind and giving spirit of volunteerism. And whereas Buchanan has long championed community service and has recognized persons who have given selflessly for the benefit of our city's fire department, Stockard Youth and Community Center and Police Department, but has not formally recognized others who generally perform many other acts of service and kindness. And whereas with the 2018 establishment of our Buchanan Volunteer Center, it is very reasonable and appropriate to henceforth recognize our community's most giving volunteers. Now therefore, I as Mayor of the City of Buchanan, pursuant to the power and authority duly vested in me, do hereby proclaim as our city's inaugural recipient of our Buchanan Exemplary Service Testimonial, that's best, you see how I struggled to make that come out, <laughs> to be Amanda Hayes. Ms. Hayes has regularly and energetically participated for many years in countless service-related projects for our community, including Relay for Life, the Upshur County Alcohol Reduction <coughs> Effort, You Care, Create Buchanan and Festival Fridays, service to our school system, her church, and her list of service and volunteering goes on and on. I further direct the establishment of our city's new best bench and the installation of a permanent placard in Jawbone Park to forever honor and recognize 
Amanda Hayes, along with all future honorees of our city's best award. I further urge all residents to join our city's <coughs> most honored guest, Amanda Hayes, her many friends and admirers, and me, along with all members of our city government family, during our public ceremony to be conducted at 7 p.m. on Thursday, October 18, 2018, as we bestow our city's very first best award. We all wish Amanda all of the best as she prepares to commence the next chapter of her professional life. May every resident be mindful of the importance of community service and giving of oneself and be inspired to give selflessly for the benefit of others as we pay tribute to and appreciate the many substantial contributions of our exceptional volunteers, including our first best honoree, Amanda Hayes. It's uh, with great pride. Appreciate you, Amanda. Thanks so much for all that you've done. And, uh, hopefully, we'll continue to do. We'd love to keep it. Thanks, man. Thank okay. <clears throat> Our uh, next guest is Andrew Schneider with Fairness West Virginia, and he brought a colleague, Mr. Billy Wolf, with him, who's your communications guru. Is that right? Yes, yes. Our communications specialist. Where do you want me to um, address? You have an elector? Right. If you, if, okay. is, that, is that convenient? Sure, sure. Um, so, first of all, thank you, Mr. Mayor and City Council, for inviting me to discuss, discuss with you the prospect of converting your uh, non discrimination resolution into a non discrimination ordinance. Um, Buckhannon, back in 2013, um, overwhelmingly unanimously, I believe, adopted the non-discrimination <coughs> resolution that indicated that Buckhannon would not would, would be a community that would not tolerate discrimination against anyone, including LGBT people. And um, since then, a number of, of communities have. Uh, come forward and decided that it was long past time to adopt laws, municipal laws, that protect their LGBTQ citizens from discrimination and employment, housing, and public accommodations. Uh, right now, we have a total of, of 11 communities statewide that have these protections. Everyone from Charleston, our largest city in the state and our capital, to Thurman, West Virginia, the smallest town in America with an LGBT non-discrimination law, population five, and all five of them voted for it, by the way. <laughs> so what I want to do before I, I go more in depth into why it's important and why it's valuable to have one of these municipal laws, I want to talk about uh, one of the, probably the, the strongest, um, I would say, or most common, probably the most common attacks that we see against LGBT non-discrimination, which actually happens to be religion. It's something we've, we've long recognized as the major source of attacks against LGBT non-discrimination come from religious sources. When we gave it some thought, though, we recognized that religion actually provides us with the strongest argument for LGBT non-discrimination and inclusivity, namely the golden rule. And that's in Christianity, of course. But that same principle, one of God's highest commandments, treating each other as you would want to be treated, exists in all major religions. And so when we, when we started talking about it as an organization, we, we realized we could, we, could actually, we could actually promote this in a way that takes the, the argument away from those who are, are citing, you know, Bible passages that claim it gives them the authority to discriminate to this golden rule, the, the principles, God's principle in most every religion that instructs us to treat each other fairly and with kindness and with decency. And so we went about trying to recruit as many religious leaders in the state of West Virginia who would be willing to come forward and talk about why their religion requires them to support and promote LGBTQ non-discrimination. And Billy, our communications specialist, 
had enormous success in doing that. First, we, our goal was to, to get 30 faith leaders. We thought that would be great if we could get just 30 of them. Uh, well, within a couple months, we easily got 30. And so then we said, OK, let's go for 50. And another month or two, we got the, the 50. And then just you know, for you know, symbolic <coughs> sake, we said, well, there's 55 counties in West Virginia. Let's get 55 faith leaders and easily got that number. We had to cap it at a certain point because we had a, our annual event, our, the Fairness Gala that took place last month, and we wanted to distill this project into a short seven-minute video, which I'm about to show you. But um, we could easily have gotten 100, and we found faith leaders from all denominations, not necessarily the ones you would think would automatically be in favor of this, but even the denominations that you think might, might have some, some trouble with this issue. Uh, so we got everyone from Catholic priests to Methodist ministers, the largest denomination in our state, Presbyterians, Episcopalians. Uh, we've got all the rabbis in the state. We've got a Quaker. We've got a Muslim. We got even a, Lakota, a person of the Lakota faith in West Virginia um, who all say the very same thing, that non-discrimination is a religious value, that LGBTQ non-discrimination is in keeping with religious principles and, and should, should be promoted from a religious standpoint. So now let's, let's give this video a watch. Preparatory humor is the best. Yeah. <laughs> but do you have any jokes? <laughs> Stand up show? I was counting on the young councilman to jump up there and fix it. Yeah, well, that leaves me out. Uh, <laughs> I thought he was talking about you. <laughs> we need we have some computer speakers. We plug them in. You're younger than me. Pretty sure we're. Uh, <laughs> That's true by a few months. <laughs> uh, I don't ever recall having this issue before. So I should probably turn the video off there. It's always something. I've never watched it. Oh, we have the presentation from the historic preservation group. Their volume looked over. to show up and show us the right plug-in. Yeah. 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 Alright, 
there's a volume thing. Is there a mute thing right there? That was Shadow Brothers, right? Try it. <laughs> 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 All right. If we unplug this audio here, it should keep the audio running through the laptop. Can you test it? Make sure it comes out of it. Nope. No. That would be too easy. Mm -hmm. Is this plugged in? Plugged in we don't really know. Okay. <laughs> that's I'm gonna why. Need, I'm going to need power for these, too. Okay. Oh, um, that's, that's back here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Here, run, 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 that, run that through there. I'll plug it in. <laughs> Do you want to just call it? Have I ever mentioned how much I like the same so you just got to call it and the the as much as get. Okay, let's try this and see what happens. Oh, something's clicking. Are the speakers on? Yeah. Turn all the way up. Not working. Did you go to a commercial break? <laughs> Dan. <laughs> we need a TV timeout. Somebody put a red vest on Thomas and stand him right there. <laughs> that would be the time for your Yeah. Sorry. You know, the test signal from that one day. The TV went off at midnight. I heard it. I heard it. I only went out to get it. Please stand by. Right. Yeah, I can't remember. Static. <laughs> National anthem. Oh, sound there. We'll see how much it sounds. Boy, boy. I don't know, guys. Oh, yeah. Let's see. What's this? <laughs> What's this? I'm I think that's the power. <laughs> that's the power. <laughs> the if the smoke gets out, we're in trouble. Is that the USB power? It's, I think it's sending the audio. It's requiring the audio to go through this cable. All right, then hold on. Try plug plug that up over here. Let's try. And then plug the speakers plug the speaker into, into this thing. Yeah. Try that. Screen went black. <laughs> oh, well, that happens. <laughs> I'm still a better door working. than a window, but I'm still a pain. <laughs> Oh, you got quick. Speakers work. That says S video though. Oh, 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 oh. do that. Do that again. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's good thing I'm sleeping. Still nothing. If I came home, I'd like my parents. Who's the technical director of Bucking? <laughs> Yeah, there's. We tried. We tried plugging that in here, but it didn't. Didn't take. Okay. Try this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, all right, guys. You might not have to. What if we full screen the video? 
turn it this way. <laughs> I'm serious, like that may be. Or just, or I could just, you could just Dr. Could Reese will hold it up. Yeah. 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 I could also talk yeah. about the video. Okay. Yeah. If you send the link, we'll disseminate yeah. it broadly. So that yeah, that's fine. Yeah. I apologize. No, no worries. Yeah. <laughs> Well, so, so we're, we've, we've now demonstrated that non-discrimination is a principal value that's, that's supported by religious leaders all over the state, by elected leaders all over the state. We also did a video a couple of years ago called Non-Discrimination is a Nonpartisan Issue, in which we uh, showcased both Republican and Democratic legislative leaders who support LGBT non-discrimination. But what the problem is that we face and the reason why we're here before you today, tonight, is because both the federal government and our state legislative government have so far failed to adopt a law that provides the LGBTQ community from, from discrimination in employment, housing, and public accommodations. So even though we have marriage equality now, and that was decided by the courts three years ago, um, you essentially can get married on Sunday, you can get fired on Monday, and you can get evicted on Tuesday. Um, because the very basic laws that so many of us take for granted that pro provide us protection from that kind of discrimination still elude the, the LGBTQ community. Um, and, it, and in, in very serious ways, um, because discrimination does take place here. I mean, I find West Virginia to be a very, um, very generous, a very inclusive, and a very um, hospitable place to live um, as, as a non-native here. Um, that's why I've decided to make West Virginia my home. But I still hear um, terrible stories from time to time. Stories like a coal miner um, who, Sam Hall, who lived in Elkview, West Virginia. And he had been working in the mines for, for years, and, and no one knew that he was gay. But he ended up uh, you know, in small town America, where he travels. And very quickly, his coworkers learned that he was in a gay relationship, uh, his now husband. And um, as that became apparent, um, he started to become the victim of, of discrimination and harassment. <coughs> he was um, called faggot on the job. His, the word faggot was scrawled on his car in the parking lot. Even his brakes were tampered with. And it became such a serious issue that his husband would be worried sick if he did not show up at the appointed hour for dinner. And he would, his husband would drive down to the mine in search of him worried that the worst might have happened. And very soon, Sam himself became worried. He, he couldn't sleep at night. He worried what might happen when he went down into the mines the next day. He really worried for his life and safety. And he did, on many occasions, complain to his supervisor about this. And his supervisor refused to do anything. Well, guess what? In Elkview, there's no non-discrimination law. And guess what? There's no non-discrimination law that protects this, against this kind of discrimination on the state level. And as I mentioned, there's also no non-discrimination protections on the federal level either. So he ended up quitting his job, uh, going to work for a, a family dollar, a dollar general store, making half the salary he was making as a coal miner. And very shortly after that, we lost him to Florida. And that's a, that, that's a sad story about West Virginia, and it's, it's kind of an iconic story because we are losing population here. Our state is losing population, and our communities are losing population because people in West Virginia, particularly our, our, our young and talented citizens, are moving to communities out of state that they deem to be more tolerant, more inclusive, and more livable communities for an, a, an LGBT minority like, the, like themselves. So we have to do something to change that because after all now, 96% of Fortune 500 companies have LGBT non-discrimination policies. And it's important because they make their decision on where to base their company, 
on where they can attract the best and brightest employees. And so they're going to think twice about moving their headquarters or moving an office to a community that doesn't have any non-discrimination protections because they're going to have trouble recruiting employees to work there. So it's, it's important for, from an economic standpoint to uh, replicate what Charleston, what Thurmond, what Morgantown, what um, Lewisburg, what Martinsburg are, are doing because they know, they want to attract, they want to compete for these companies, for, the, for this economic development, for the best and brightest employees. They also want to compete for the best and, and brightest people to come and raise their families in their communities. And they don't want to lose out on their talented young people from moving away. So it is, it is also very, very much entwined with, with economic survival. Um, and then beyond that, there, there's obviously the, the moral issue. The moral issue, you know, so sometimes you hear things from the other side, like this is about, you know, shouldn't, shouldn't a baker have a right to refuse a, 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 a wedding cake for a gay couple? And you think, oh, wedding cakes, you know, maybe, I don't know, you know. But when you think about it, West Virginia is a very rural state. So when a business refuses service to a certain group of people, it's not like they have the choice of going elsewhere because sometimes that might be the only bakery for miles. And you know, it's not within everyone's means to travel long distances for basic services. And the wedding cake is just the, is, is, is sort of almost the, the, um, the, the example they throw out there to diminish the seriousness of what this is all about. I mean, just imagine if, if a healthcare provider could refuse service medical care because it was against their religious conscience to serve an LGBT minority, or any minority for that matter. I mean, that would seem unconscionable to most people. Yet, if we, if we feel that you know, businesses in the marketplace and, our, and you know, under our public accommodations laws, you know, should be able to pick and choose who they serve. That's exactly what we're saying. We're giving the green light to the most serious instance of discrimination, which could be a life or death situation. So we have to think about that. We have to think about the, the economic vitality of our communities. And, and we also have to think about who we are as a people in West Virginia. And, and I think we are good people here. We are people who want to be inclusive. I mean, Buchanan is a very inclusive place from, from what I know of it. I mean, you've had, um, you, you, you first of all, unanimously adopted the non-discrimination resolution back in 2013 when few of these resolutions or ordinances were on the books anywhere. So you're one of the first and one of the leaders in that respect. You've also had a, a gay pride festival here in the past. You've had, you know, hate not in our community, no hate in our community events here. So you, you had the spirit exists in Buchanan to do this, to do the right thing. And the fact, and I'm going to address this because this is, is certainly something that comes up often. You know, does this lead to frivolous lawsuits? Is this going to be a burden on businesses? The, the very simple answer is no. Uh, these laws have been in place since 2007 with Charleston being the first community to adopt this. And so in 11 years, Charleston, our largest city in the state, has only had two cases uh, brought before them uh, that involved LGBT, LGBT discrimination. And both of those cases uh, prevailed. Both of those uh, individuals who had discrimination claims prevailed because their cases had merit. So this does not, in any way, shape, or form, lead to frivolous lawsuits or an uh, onslaught uh, against the, county, the, the local courthouse. Um, in fact, of all 11 communities that have these laws, only those two in Charleston are, are cases that came uh, before the, the courts invoking those, those uh, uh, statutes. So two cases in 11 years involving 11 communities, that's, that's a pretty small amount of, of lawsuits given this, this law. And that's, that's been the, the, the experience of the 19 states that have these statewide protections. They also find that there are very few lawsuits that actually um, come uh, to court invoking those particular laws. 
then why, why are these laws important? Because they make people feel safe. Because if, and, and they also set the example. They act as a deterrence as well. So those who are bad actors don't engage in, in that type of, of bad and wrongful behavior. Um, you know, the question might come up is, you know, well, if, if Buckhannon is such a, a good, inclusive community where businesses typically do the right thing, why do we need such a law? Well, the answer is that not everyone may do the right thing. Um, that is, was said in the Federalist Papers by uh, Madison and Hamilton, our, the framers of our Constitution, that um, men are not always angels. And we, we require laws to set forth good behavior and to make sure our communities do operate smoothly <coughs> without um, bad things going on. And we, have, we, require, we require various laws, various laws that the city council has enacted time and time before that, that apply to businesses in the way that they have to run their businesses to make sure that our businesses abide by certain things that we all believe are very important, health and safety reg regulations, restrictions to name a few, fire safety regulations. So this is just in, in league with the many other ordinances that you have adopted in the past. Um, and then, I'm trying to think if, I want to make sure I've covered everything. Um, but uh, I would say that, uh, that in, in closing, that you, you are, would be in good company, uh, that this is, I think this is also important as, as a driver for ultimately the state to do the right thing. But we need the municipalities to do them first because the state and the federal government are not in any position to do to take this up, you know, anytime soon. And should we deny our LGBT citizens the protections, these basic fundamental protections, in waiting for the federal government or the state to act? And I say no because some of these protections are extremely serious and can not only involve the quality of life, but sometimes life itself. So I thank you for inviting me to address your council. I'm happy to address any questions. Um, you may have heard, I'd be interested in addressing questions because you, there may have been discussions about, about this in the past and, or some misconceptions or, or just basic concerns that you might have that I might be able to answer. Well, questions, Mr. Hashim. You mentioned the two cases in Charleston. Yeah. What was the result of that? What was levied against the defendants? Oh, that reminded me. So the other, the other thing, important thing to know about these laws is that they don't put any, they don't place any burden on city government. They simply provide a private cause of action to the victims of, of this type of discrimination. So the burden is on the victim actually to find a lawyer because they now have a cause of action. That's what you've established. That's what you would have established by adopting one of these laws. So it's up to the victim to find the lawyer and take the case to court. And to answer your question, um, in one case it involved a, a local nonprofit that um, discovered um, this, this woman who was hired to be the executive director of a local nonprofit discovered that uh, before she actually even started her job, after she was offered employment, that she was in a lesbian relationship. It was apparent, became apparent on Facebook, on social media. And within the first couple of days of her employment, um, the, she was summarily fired for her sexual orientation. And so this woman ended up taking um, the, the nonprofit to court, her employer to court, to, in circuit court, and uh, those, the judge ruled that, yes, indeed, the, the local business, the nonprofit, was in violation of their non-discrimination law. And so they were, um, not only were they, I think there was a small fine or something um, under, under the terms of the laws as the penalty, and they were, they were ordered to, um, I'm not sure if they were ordered to reinstate her, or she was, she was provided with some type of, of restitution for her, her case, but it, it was no, no burden was placed on the city because this involved a but private the, employer. The, but the employer was, the burden was placed on That's correct, that's correct. 
And there's and I guess there are certain limits within the city code to what that that penalty can be. I mean, we ultimately would want to have a state law and a federal law because the penalties can be more serious and more fitting the crime. These these penalties are, are not, you know, I mean they 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 are still serious, but you know, of course, um, ultimately. The, the best option would be to get a state and federal law that, that really would um, go a long way to stopping this type of discrimination. But in the meantime, it's very important that municipalities um, basically send the right message and also protect our citizens from that type of discrimination. All right. In the meantime, now, this, you mentioned the, the gay couple going to a baker and asking for a cake and being refused, and this would be protected under this law, right? Um, <clears throat> so, to a certain degree. My question would be if, if there's a gay baker and some other couple came in and asked for something that they oppose, does it protect them? Well, yes. First of all, sexual orientation protections don't, sexual orientation is a very broad word. We all have a sexual orientation. We all have a gender identity. So, you, you may be heterosexual, you would be protected under sexual orientation protections because yours is just as much a sexual orientation as mine is. So yes. Thank you. Sure. Other questions for Mr. Schneider? Was the, uh, Mr. Schneider, um, I have two questions. Yeah. The first one is, um, how are churches affected with this ordinance? And so, the, okay, go ahead. Okay, to answer the first question, churches are not affected at all. Um, churches are not considered public accommodations, and so that they are completely, uh, completely free of, of this this type of, of regulation. <coughs> and I would never want to compel a church to do something in contrary to its teachings. Um, I, full disclosure, I used to head up the ACLU, and. One of the things that I hold dearest, nearest and dearest to my heart is the First Amendment. First Amendment, a right to practice your religion, free of government interference. What if that church is a registered nonprofit? Well, again, if it's, if it's under a public accommodation that does business, that profits in the community, that, then they are subject to public accommodations laws. I mean, if you're setting up a business that serves the general public, not just your faith, members of your faith, then you become a public accommodation. So, so your answer is if a church is a registered 501c3 nonprofit, then they, they are also exempt. They're, all, they're exempt, yes. So there couldn't be an employment discrimination for a church who hires someone and then realizes that that person may or may not agree with their particular Right, anything, any, any entity that is, is completely within the church um, and church operated, um, as long as it's not a business that profits, a for-profit business, they are completely exempt. They can hire and fire whoever they choose, and that's the right way. The only reason I ask is yeah. because you said the, the, the last lawsuit that you mentioned was a non-profit organization. But not a religious one. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions for Andrew Schneider? So your recommendation from... Fairness, West Virginia, is that we elevate what we did nearly six years ago in February of 2013, uh, go from a mere resolution, which is uh, precatory in large part, it's, it's encouraging people to uh, not discriminate against anyone because of their orientation. Although we did adopt as a, as a mandate relative to anything that involves the city from an employment perspective or a contractor perspective, we don't tolerate discrimination based upon orientation pursuant to that resolution. This, this ordinance would take the resolution to the next level, if you will. It would add that cause of action that you're talking about, that if someone was discriminated against, they don't sue the city they can go to circuit court and file a civil action uh, like you could if you slipped and fell in somebody's parking lot. Correct. Yes, yes, definitely. I would encourage you to work with our city attorney, Tom O'Neill, uh, to maybe advance uh, some forms so that he can counsel with us as we 
consider going forward with this measure. And in the uh, weeks, months to come, we may uh, want you to come back and readdress uh, the group so that we can get further information. Does that sound like an acceptable absolutely, plan? Absolutely, absolutely. I'd be happy to do that. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for coming, Andrew. Sure. Thank you for having me. Thank you. We'll, we'll thank chat you. again so, Thank you. Have a safe trip home. Thank you. Okay. Next up is uh, we have representatives from the Upshur County Homeless uh, and Housing Coalition. I would tell you, Council, that uh, I've attended a meeting or two of this excellent group over the past couple of months, and I, I kind of put a bug in their ear as we heard more about the needs of our community and uh, advanced uh, the notion that they appear before the City Council and uh, give us some information, and maybe we can all work together to get us into a better place uh, as far as homelessness. So, Kathy, are you sort of the primary spokesperson this evening? I am. I'm Kathy McMurray. I'm Glad the executive director of Mountain Community Action Partnership. We are a uh, nonprofit uh, community action agency, but I also serve as chair of the Homeless and Housing Coalition here in Upshur County. So I'm going to speak for a little bit on the definitions of homelessness. I think Matt's going to give you some statistics you may not be aware of. And Alicia will be here to uh, give you an actual story about one or two people who have experienced homelessness in this community. And um, just so you know who's here is either a member of the coalition or is here to support the Homeless and Housing Coalition, if you would stand up. So that you have an idea of who's here for Thank you all our support. You. And before I get started, I just want to segue for one minute. Excuse me, group. But um, based on your opening statement, Mayor, uh, Mountain Cat is actually in the process of training some of our staff to be trainers on the issue of suicide and how to have conversation, ordinary conversations with people. Um, once we are trained and train our staff, we want to reach out to the community and provide some training so that people aren't afraid to talk about the subject. Some people are, are afraid if they say suicide, it's going to cause somebody to commit suicide. That's not the case. Um, so we'll be offering and rolling that out, and I'll bring more information when we're a little further along. Thanks. Back to homelessness. Okay, so the definition, it's actually quite complicated. There's just not one simple definition. Um, the core definition is an individual or family who lacks fixed, regular, or adequate nighttime residence. Um, so it means they're uh, sleeping in a place not designated or ordinary use for sleeping accommodations. A car, a park, abandoned buildings, a bus or train station. It also includes those who are in a homeless shelter or who are in a transitional housing. It can also include someone who is institutionalized, um, whether it be mental institution, jail, etc., cetera, um, but who's been homeless before that and has only been institutionalized for 90 days or less. Then we have those who are at imminent risk of homelessness. And that includes an individual or family who's being evicted within the next 14 days. And they have no subsequent resident that's, residence that's been identified. And they have no uh, family or other resources uh, to help them provide or obtain permanent housing. Then we have a definition for the people who are um, experiencing persistent housing instability. And it's people with all of these characteristics. They are considered unaccompanied youth, meaning they're less than 25 years of age, or family with children and youth. They're defined as homeless under, we use the housing and urban development definition of homelessness primarily, but the uh, public education system has a different definition. Um, so if they've been identified under that definition, um, they've not had a lease, ownership interest, or occupancy agreement in permanent housing in the past 60 days. Um, they've moved two or more times during those 60 days and has one or more of the following chronic disability, which can be physical, mental, or health, substance addiction, histories of domestic violence, or childhood abuse, a child with a disability, and two or more barriers um, to employment, which can include um, a lack of a high school or GED, high school degree or GED, illiteracy, low English proficiency, history of incarceration or detention for criminal activity, and history of unstable employment. Then we have the category um, of any family or individual who's fleeing or is attempting to flee domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, stalking, or other dangerous or life-threatening condition 
that relates to violence, has no other residents, <coughs> and lacks the resources or support network to find other permanent housing. So that's four broad categories. And then we have the definition for those who are chronically homeless. And chronic homelessness are as an individual or a head of household um, who has a disability and who lives either in a place not meant for human habitation, a safe haven, or emergency shelter, uh, or has lived in those continuously for at least 12 months, or has had at least four separate occasions in the last three years of homeless epi episodes um, that amount to 12 months of, of uh, homelessness. So that's chronic homelessness. And so I think there's a lot of stereotypical assumptions we make when we think of homelessness. We think of the person living on the street, literally, that um, you might have to step over in a doorway, or et cetera. But Matt's going to share some of the statistics that might surprise you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Kathy, Kathy's right. Um, homelessness does not generally look like what we think it does. Uh, we have a tendency to um, think of alcoholic middle-aged men are the only people that are homeless, and that's actually not the case. Uh, we think they're unemployable or unemployed. 45% of all the homeless people in the United States are employed full-time um, and have worked within the last 30 days. 25% um, of homeless people do have a substance abuse problem, so that means that 75% of them don't. 25% um, of them also have a serious mental illness, uh, which limits their ability to work. Um, generally, homelessness is an economic problem. And it's not the mental health or the addiction problem that we think it is. Um, again, we also have a tendency to think that it's middle-aged people or older people, adults, who um, you know, ha have through the course of their life, taken some wrong turns and ended up homeless. The average age of a homeless person in the United States right now is nine. Um, while in some areas we have made progress, since 2010, um, because of some initiatives done in the Obama administration, we've cut homeless veteran, the homeless veteran population in half. Um, but we're seeing increased numbers of women, children, and families who are homeless. A lot of people in this country who are one or two missed paychecks away from being homeless. Um, you know, a lot of people when they're in those situations where they're employed but they have low, low income jobs end up in situations where they end up often trapped in like weekly rate motels because they can make enough money in their paycheck to pay for another week at the motel, but they can't save enough for a deposit. You know, they can't do the first months in a security deposit. You know, they just end up trapped in that cycle. Um, and there has been some progress, but we've seen attacks in other areas. Um, you know, right now, you know, we've, again, we just said 25% of the homeless population is addicted. And um, currently, the West Virginia is split into four continuums of care um, that address homelessness through HUD. Um, one of them is in the northern panhandle, the Wheeling area. There's another continuum in the Kanawha Valley, one that takes in the Capital Wayne County areas around Huntington, and the rest of the 44 counties are in what we call the uh, balance of state continuum of care. And we have zero homeless programs to address addiction in that 44 county area now. We used to have one here in Buckhannon, we don't anymore uh, because of the shift in HUD strategy and how they want to address homelessness. I've done the um, point in time count. We didn't do it last year, but I did it for about 10 years prior to that. Every year, HUD tries to count all the homeless people in America in one day. And they usually do it in the last week of January because it's colder then and they're much more of them are driven to shelters and it's easier to count them. Generally in Buckhannon, we found anywhere from 8 to 13 people who were living unsheltered outdoors in the third week of January. Um, that tends to go up in the um, summertime. I fish a lot in the river, and actually you'll see a lot of um, homeless encampments, more so in the summer than you do in the winter. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a, a fortunate and unfortunate part of Appalachian culture that we generally don't let people we know be homeless. So that um, actually takes some people out of the count 
for, for being homeless and the impact of the amount of resources that come to us. Sometimes because it got cold out and somebody's grandmother finally caved in and let them come back into the house, it might eliminate them from the chronic homeless status, you know, which eliminates a lot of potential for uh, housing for them. So it's, it's definitely not what we think it is. I mean, you know, the, you know, through media, through movies and television, we get a we have a, a perception of what a homeless person looks like, and, and for the most part, that tends to be inaccurate. You know, we, we all thought that everybody thought when I would do these counseling, go, well, we only have one homeless guy in town. You know, Carson. <laughs> Carson was not homeless. Look, homeless. He fit the view that we have of what homeless people should look like. But he really wasn't homeless. Um, you know, the, the view that we should have are women, families, children who, who are um, just as likely to be homeless now as anybody else. Jim and Alicia can. What's the national figure as far as homeless across the country? Raw numbers? To be honest, I couldn't tell you accurately right now. I haven't looked at that in a while. When you said they do a census Right, and HUD does an annual report to Congress that includes that. Um, the VA system does a separate report to Congress because they do basically the same thing because why shouldn't we do the same thing twice with the federal government so we can you know, spend twice as much money doing it. <laughs> but uh, to be honest, it's just, I haven't actually run a homeless program in about three years now, so I'm not looking at those numbers with the frequency that I used to. I'm Alicia randolph Rapking, and I can be found most days at the Upshur Parish House in Cross Lines, where I am the director, and I have been for the last eight and a half years. And in that eight and a half years, I have had the occasion to come across a lot of people who have fit one of those definitions that you have heard tonight. And when I go out and talk to people, people will say to me, oh, we don't have a homeless problem in Upshur County. Well. We do. And one of the reasons we wanted to come tonight is to let you know that we're, we're really trying to work on this, um, really trying to address this issue. I have a bumper sticker that's on my filing cabinet in my office, and it says simply, everyone deserves a home. And I look at that every day as I hear stories every day as well. So I'm going to ask you to use your imagination just for a moment, and I'm going to ask you to think about something with your imagination. So we, you know, on my phone earlier this afternoon, I got that beep that said we're in a frost warning uh, tonight, beginning at 11 o'clock. It's going to be cold. So I want you to imagine that you are a middle 50-year-old woman <coughs> who really can't read or write. You have been chronically homeless all of your life. You are in and out of the city of Buchanan over and over and over again. Um, and you are always looking for a place to stay. So you come to the parish house to see what the parish house and cross lines can do. And they can put you up for a couple of nights and then it got, gets desperate and maybe they put you up in, your, in the bunkhouse and you stay there because you have enough money every month, about $743 coming in every month, which is not a lot of money and it is difficult to find housing. So then you get approved for HUD, but the housing doesn't come forward and the bunkhouse that we have suddenly it's not available in October on a night like tonight because there's no heat in it. What are you going to do? I want you to imagine that you are a woman with two kids. You have a job, but you've been suddenly evicted from your home. You have a job. The place that you could go for the night tonight is the women's shelter in Elkins, but you have a job here and your kids are in school here. And that's a burden to get from Elkins to your kids' schools and then to your job. What is your option? Until you can get housed again, which takes two to three weeks, 
you have no option, so you stay in your car. I want you to imagine that you leave here and you don't really have a home to go to, but your friend will let you live in, your, in their garage because you don't really have a home to go to and you don't have enough money coming in because you haven't been approved for disability or assistance in any way and you have a part-time job as a security guard, but you don't have enough money for a home. So you live in your friend's garage for three years with no electricity, no heat, no bathroom. If all of these stories sound extreme to you, I have encountered all three of these people in the last eight and a half years, one of them over and over again. For up until April of this year, when people came to us and needed a place temporarily, they've gotten evicted or they've gotten out of jail and they didn't have anywhere to go, we had the ability to put them up for two nights in a hotel. But as of April, we can't do that anymore. Um, the hotels are full around here now with other people, pipeliners, and, and we can't find that space. So we've had to stop that program at Crosslines. And for the last three years, we have paid out over $13,000 putting the citizens of Upshur County up for two to three nights until they can get somewhere, grandma's couch or into another home. $13,000 three years in a row. And we can't do that anymore. The space isn't available. So what has happened since April is that DHHR has had to pick up some, some of what we were doing. And so they have, they're running close to, by year's end, somewhere over $10,000. Their numbers each month have jumped. Um, so why are we coming to you tonight? It's cold. We don't have a lot of options here in Upshur County. And you may start seeing some people this year. It's something we want you to be aware of. It's something that we want to work with you guys to address. We'd invite you to come to our meetings. When's our next meeting, Kathy? It would be just uh, <laughs> It's the it's second, second Wednesday, Wednesday in November <laughs> at the parish house at 2 o'clock. So we invite you to come. I mean, um, every other month. That's why we yeah. were hesitating. Um, and we want you to be aware that we are struggling with this issue, that we have folks who deserve a home, a place to sleep tonight that's warm. We don't have any easy answers, but we're working on it and we need your help. So we would like to ask if we can come back after the first of the year and maybe give you some more information and have a little bit more time to talk. Can I ask you a couple questions? Sure. Uh, how many beds are in the bunkhouse? We can sleep, well, okay, our bunk, <laughs> our bunk house has two rooms um, and we have used it for work teams. Uh, so each room has eight bunk beds, can sleep 16 people. How, have you got a quote to install heat by any chance from the car? We haven't yet. It does have running water. It has handicap accessible bathrooms, running water, washer and dryer, does not have a kitchen and it doesn't have heat. But when you need someone on, on their responsible party on there, if you were allowing people to use it so that- Absolutely. You, we can't just say, okay, go, go, go there, there now. Heat. We, yeah, we there need a plan in need place. A, a whole mm -hmm. management yes. structure. Right. Yeah. Your next meeting is Wednesday, November 14th. Second Wednesday. It's November Wednesday, 14th. November 14th. At the parish house. At what right. time? Do 2 p.m. 2 p.m. 2 o'clock. We'll uh, try to have municipal representation in the future. Thank you. Very and, much. Are you going to plan on maybe addressing this with the county commission as well? I, I kind of address this every year with the county commission, <laughs> but it, it will be more of a. I'm hoping to be more organized this year because it, prior to this year we had a sort of a solution. But now we don't. So. Until a few years ago, the county court gave $10,000 a year. 
that they cut that off about three years ago. Okay. Did you feel that the month the thirteen thousand dollars that you were spending was an effective uh, solution in any capacity to helping these people? It was an extremely short-term solution, and once we paid out for two nights in a hotel, we could not help them with deposits or first month's rent. So after they came to us, then there wasn't anything else we could do. And so it was a very short-term solution. It did not really help to rehouse them. Because most of them really need some sort of case management to help them move, yes. eliminate barriers. I have to see. Yeah. I guess the questions are: Are some of these instances where people uh, are homeless? Is there an element to some of these instances where uh, people just aren't aware of the resources? and the network of help that is available, that they don't even know to come to the parish house to try to see if there's help? Is that is that part of the equation? Maybe. And is there nothing at the state level, through DHHR or anyone of that sort, that would address this kind of a concern as it's posed? Sarah? <laughs> Hi, I am Sarah Sabowitz. I work with the Adult Service Unit, um, and we have the homeless program. I'm involved in that um, in that section, and we do have um, a program that um, similarly talks about the definition of homelessness. Um, would not include, you know, a camper that doesn't have heat in the winter. Um, a, a car is not a shelter. Um, we see. Uh, the same types of um, families, individuals, children who come in. <clears throat> and we can pay the, the amount of rent, um, for example, for here has gone up, but our payment has stayed the same. And so we can only match so much if they qualify. We also look at their long-term plans. Um, we want to be able to solve a long-term solution for them or come up with a long-term solution and um, not just have two nights in a, in a motel, because long-term, that's not gonna solve their problem. Um, we wanna try to connect them with resources, and so that's all. We do a little bit of case management, but it's not ongoing. Does that answer? Another program that has been available in this area is a rapid rehousing program. The caseload of that program is just really high, um, not enough places to place people. So the particular person that I talked about first, chronic homeless, can't read or write, mid-50s, this particular person uh, we had working with Rapid Rehousing, that office is in Randolph County, couldn't find anything for her to rent over here at that particular time. She could find something in Randolph County, but that took her away from all the support she had. Um, so there are some programs, but there are lots of different variables that don't always make it a viable solution. And Mountain Cap has supportive services for veteran families, specifically for very low income homeless veterans who have an honorable discharge or anything less than, or have anything but a dishonorable discharge, I should say. And um, it can help with rapid rate housing, so it can pay some rent until, you know, just deposit some rent until someone can get back on their feet. Or it can help prevent homelessness by paying rent, maybe just help somebody catch up, or utility arrears, something like that. Um, but we cover six counties with one case manager on that program. Um, Questions for Kathy or Alicia or Matt or any of the other representatives of the Homeless Coalition? We'll, uh, we'll try to help. We we'll, don't have anything firm to offer you tonight, but we will continue the conversation to see how it is that we might be able to help. We appreciate it a great deal. It's just enough to be able to address you and to remind you we have citizens who need to be warm. Are, so are thank any you. of the churches helping at all? Um, Churches are doing quite a bit. I mean, the churches all support what we do, um, but 
at the same time, there, I mean, you can't just open a church as a homeless shelter. There's a lot that has to go into that. Um, so one of, the, one of the reasons we're here tonight is that this has become crisis for us. So we need help. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for reminding us about the problem. So, so far tonight we've talked about suicide, mistreatment of gay people, and the homeless population. Uh, Robin, you got something good to tell us? Maybe you'll, you'll, <laughs> something you're going to bring us up about, right? <laughs> Thank you all for coming. We'll, we'll be back with you soon. Thank you. So, uh, I know it's not normal, but I'll be brief. <laughs> um, so I appreciate it, uh, giving me the opportunity tonight to come and address the uh, council, and appreciate that, uh, Mr. Uh, Mayor. And uh, wanted to kind of just give a quick update of the Innovation Center. I know I uh, haven't been here for a while, and a lot of things are going on, a lot of things, a lot of things the other, on the other side haven't gone on down there. So. Uh, in comparison to the Citizens Bank building, I feel like it was that time I went out for track and I got lapped. Um, but the uh, Citizens Bank building is going very well. Our project is a federal project, so um, it does have its intricacies about uh, certain things, so that does tend to slow things down a little bit. I'm sure Mike has uh, uh, and understand the federal government and their, their demands. Um, but we are on track. Uh, we are rolling um, on the project. Uh, we did get the footers poured. It is a three-story building of brick and, and steel, so the footers were pretty, uh, pretty intense. A lot of, a lot of rebar in there. Um, it was overall 115 yards of concrete just in the footers alone. Um, the uh, the foundation block is being uh, put in right now and laid. Uh, so that should be coming up. You should see over the next couple of weeks um, the stairwells, uh, both in the front and the rear, kind of going up past the first floor. Uh, they'll also start working on the uh, elevator shaft as well. So um, then come November, which is right around the corner, we're going to start, the building has a steel girder structure, so you're going to start seeing uh, the erection of steel um, at the building, and that'll basically take it up three stories, and then um, after the first of the year, you'll start to see uh, the brick veneer going in and uh, and going up as well. So, uh, so far, uh, minus a few delays here and there, but things are going pretty well on the project. Um, and uh, haven't had anything uh, uh, major. The one thing that uh, I did want to bring to council's attention, um, we talked about, Jerry's not here, uh, when we had our planning meetings for um, before the project started, we talked about street closures and things like that, and Jerry and, and Vince and uh, Bryson, and, and uh, we talked about how when the steel goes up, um, it might be a better opportunity, more efficient and quicker uh, opportunity to be able to have a crane there on Spring Street uh, to be able to erect the steel. So the question was that uh, bring council attention to the fact that there may be a request uh, to close the street from uh, Spring Street from Main Street just to the end of our property um, for a period of uh, four to five weeks to put the steel up and get that in done. And I don't know what the what the opinion is of council or how you all feel about that. I know street uh, closers are never a fun thing. Need, I would need to go before the Consolidated Public Works Board. Okay. So they meet the fourth Thursday of every month, except okay. the November, December because of the Thanksgiving thing. Yeah. It's December 4th, I want to say. So we'll try to get our contractor and architect and uh, to get to that meeting at the end of the month, okay. right? Yeah. Um, we're looking at a, at a completion date around the end of April, middle of May. Um, the one goal, if we don't have the interior completed from a standpoint of uh, occupancy ready, uh, the biggest concern is let's make sure we get everything on the outside tidied up and cleaned up before the middle of May because that's Strawberry Festival, so we definitely want to have that all done and, and fleshed out. So that's that's kind of the process. Farmers Alden says bad winter this year. Hopefully not. I'm a skier. I always love snow, but this year I would like it to not snow. Uh, so we'll see. But that's that's all I have for you guys. Any questions that you have? Questions, Sharab, about the new building? Do you, do you, I, I know it's premature, but do, do you have 
your leases, your tenants are coming along relative to the discussions? And yeah, so um, Region 7 will be moving over to the building um, on July 1st, and uh, uh, obviously we'll be moving over into the building. The other tenants that we have, and here's the rub, <clears throat> because it's a EDA project, we can't do any build out on the third floor or the first floor for new tenants. We can't start that until we complete the EDA project, which is completion of the first floor conference community room and the second floor. Um, so we have tenants that are that are verbally committed to go into the building, um, but they're not going to commit uh, contractually until we get a little closer to when they can actually start doing build out. That's understandable. Questions for Rob, by you? Thanks, Rob. Keep, Thank you guys. Like, I Keep don't plugging along. Room, but I have to, I have to yep. leave. Yep. Don't, forget, don't your, forget your coat. Yep, your coat's okay. Yeah. Okay, De department and board reports. If, if Callie and Jerry's not here and Ambie wouldn't mind, we've, we've been yeah. waiting to recognize some of Matt's troops. Can, uh, can we jump to the, uh, at least the ceremonial element of what you want to do, Chief Gregory? It's all yours. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just yesterday, uh, two of our officers, uh, Marshall O'Connor and Josh Wilson, uh, took and passed uh, the corporal exam uh, for the police department. Uh, both of these officers uh, began their careers with the Buchanan City Police Department in 2013, and upon reaching that five-year anniversary, were eligible for this exam. Uh, Mayor, at this time, if I could call uh, both Marshall O'Connor and Josh Wilson and their families forward for a painting ceremony. Absolutely. Chief. Floor is yours. Sorry to keep you waiting just so long, guys. <laughs> <laughs> you guys come on up front here. back in a minute, Matt. We know that uh, Callie's going to be brief, right, Callie? <laughs>
documents, you've got the usual that I've been providing in the front, uh, just a little bit of information about the traffic to our website and social media, Facebook. Um, usually around 200 per day, see we we're staying with that, and we just had that bump one week of um, sharing that community unity had to be canceled last week. Um, some of the shares that we had the most of on Facebook were um, the nice donation we received from Buchanan and Toyota for $20,000 for a stalker. That one got over 1,000 views. Um, also, our congratulations to Dion Walmsley and Jamie Green of the fire department. That one got a lot of views, as well as the one uh, congratulating Justin Atwell. Um, so those were some of our most popular Facebook posts. Um, we had a little bit of confusion that uh, Robbie had alerted me to between our website and the uh, new My Buchanan website, but I think that's been cleared up. And I think that's be people will become more familiar with My Buchanan. Uh, that hopefully won't happen anymore. But uh, we, of course, just to reiterate, we, uh, BuchananWV.org is the city of Buchanan's website, and MyBuchanan.com is a new web platform, but private business and separate from the city of Buchanan. So just wanted to make sure that was clear for everybody. Um, from our volunteer center, from Casey Gilbert, I uh, wanted to pass along, of course, our new day for the Community Unity and Kindness Day will be on October 27th, so not this Saturday, but next Saturday. Uh, November 1st, we'll start our Buchanan Recycles campaign. We're having a free grant writing workshop on November 2nd from about 9 to 12 at the Public Safety Complex. And uh, we have a couple of guest speakers joining us for that, as well as myself. Um, on the volunteer platform, we have people looking, I just will give you a couple of uh, what people are looking for. If there's any interest in being a team member with the Red Cross, uh, the MLPA is looking for stream monitors and a web designer. Uh, VIPS is always looking for people. Just wanted to give you an idea of the different kind of volunteering opportunities there are within the community. And please go check out the website sometime. If you haven't already, you can see what's out there. People who are looking for help, or maybe you yourself and your organization needs help, and you can put that on the Volunteer Center platform. Uh, with other grants, uh, met with Chief Gregory and Lieutenant Loudon yesterday to discuss police grant opportunities for 2019. Had a good discussion with them. Also went down to the Appalachian Regional Commission, had a workshop in Flatwoods last week and talking about their funding priorities for 2019. And so got some ideas there, but uh, maybe we'll discuss that more later since I'm running a little behind. Um, and then just the upcoming events, of course, we've got the Municipal League in town next week. War of the Worlds coming up at Colonial Theater. Our rescheduled date for Community Unity and Kindness Day of the 27th. And the Halloween events, looking forward to that. And I mentioned everything else other than, uh, of course, Veterans Day will be coming up too. And our service scholar from Westland has been doing a great job, and she's looking forward to maybe featuring another local veteran or family member of a local veteran and doing another one of those nice videos um, that were popular when we did that back on Memorial Day. So, um, I also have the people for bikes to submit, have that pretty much ready to go. I have that later down in the agenda, or I can talk to you about that now very quickly. You want us to bring that up to the table on F3 under strategic? I'd entertain a motion that we bring F3 to the table. So we have a motion and a second. I think it was Skinner and Rigger. No, it wasn't. No, it was Rigger. Uh, Rigger or the Rigger one. Rigger, uh, what, you, you're doing the minutes. You do it the way you want to. Uh, is there discussion on the motion? No. Call for the question. All those in favor of bringing F3 to the table, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, F3 is now on the table. And Kelly, tell us about this application, uh, People for Bikes program. Mm -hmm. And you might recall that back in July, uh, you approved a letter of intent to apply. You had to do a letter of intent in order to apply for this particular grant. I guess they liked uh, what we had presented to them. They asked us for a full application. It is a small grant, uh, $10,000 from them, matched with in-kind uh, services from our streets department and some of our equipment and facilities uh, to do a open streets, um, have a pump track and pot track for biking, as well as some fitness classes all surrounding Jawbone Park uh, four times in 2019, so it would be next summer, if we were to be awarded 
the Would this uh, potentially be in keeping and a compliment to if the abandoned mines program grant comes through? Would that not be a natural segue with that kind of stuff? I think it does demonstrate that we're doing, you know, more pedestrian and bike friendly and complete streets that align with our strategic planning goals. Those are all mentioned within the 2015 and 2020 plan and I presume will be continued on now as the Planning Commission is looking at the 2025 plan as well. Right. And of course with Stockard being, being adjacent to Jawbone as well. Uh, we'll be able to open it up to those uh, people that enjoy Stockard Youth Center, be able to get involved with this type of uh, activity too. It's also, we'd like to have it coincide with the farmer's market so that it's connected to not only healthy activity, but also healthy eating and our little more activity going on during the farmer's market perhaps. Okay. Gentlemen, since we don't have Pam or Mary here, I would entertain a motion that we be, we authorize uh, the application for this grant. So moved. I have a motion by Mr. Skinner. Could I have a second to his motion? Second. I have a second by Mr. Thomas. Is there discussion on the motion? Hearing of the need for none, I'll call for that question. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, like sign. Motion carries. Willow is waiting for her mom. Yes, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. Thanks, Callie. All right, next up is uh, our uh, Public Works Director Jerry Arnold, who is home suffering with the gout. I probably just did, it violated HIPAA laws and everything else by yeah. telling you that. <laughs> you Jer Jerry, Jerry's posting it on Facebook, so I'm just uh, passing along the word. Uh, Jerry will hopefully be back to work next week, but he is in a lot of pain tonight. Uh, his report's in your uh, packet. Uh, just real quickly, uh, he's working with Amby and the mayor for the solicitation of applicants for the engineer position at the sewer plant, in case you had missed the news flash, Raz Rizzo uh, has uh, resigned. Uh, the sanitary board earlier today designated Buck Samples, who's been with us for 40 years, as uh, the acting superintendent for sewer works. And we are working on a job description to solicit applications for a new sanitary sewer engineer. Uh, Jerry also says he'll be getting evaluation forms out so that supervisors can do the year-end uh, evaluations of all of our employees. Uh, he's moving his office into the former lieutenant's office uh, downstairs to allow more office space uh, upstairs. The water department, uh, there's several things on there. Most of it has to do with updates on the Atlantic Coast Pipeline project. Uh, the sewer department, we've already talked about some of that. Uh, the Waste Department, the board approved financing for a new truck through Community Bank. Uh, also, Alice Teets out front, uh, one of our clerical folks, is segueing from half-time parking enforcement, half-time clerical to full-time clerical. So Amby will be looking to hire a new uh, part-time clerical, half-time uh, parking attendant. Yeah. Uh, street Department, the guys are still working on Trader's Alley. Uh, they've been working in the Colonial Theater on rainy days. Uh, they're in the process of installing 200 feet of guardrail along Upper Drive. And uh, Jay's got all kinds of engineering stuff there that you're free to read at your leisure. So that's uh, Jerry's report. Next up is our Director of Finance and Administration, Amby Jenkins. Good morning. Morning. Uh, I'm going to start out with the big event. Um, the biggest highlight was our illumination dinner, so I want to catch up on the, some of the totals there. Um, at the elimination dinner with the tickets and the games from the evening we collected twelve thousand three hundred dollars the materials and expenses were twenty four hundred and then we had a grand park prize payout of a thousand but the winner of that which was jeff st Clair, uh, left 401 for us and he took 599 so we netted <laughs> so we netted ninety three hundred dollars in profits from the dinner and i think we have a little more money coming in from uh, the convention and visitors bureau because they were uh, taking i think a dollar off of the beer sales and they're going to return that to us 
And then we received a large donation from Buchanan Toyota for $20,000 towards Stockard Hayes Center. And then the Moose uh, donated $1,300. Now we've received several thousand dollars in donations. Um, this community has really overwhelmingly supported this uh, project and uh, we hope to maybe get a list of those contributors. Once it's all said and done, maybe post that on our website so everyone can see, because it doesn't matter if it was a dollar or $20,000, we appreciated every bit of it and we really appreciate the community support for that. Um, Tommy Albaugh, of course, um, as you know, passed away. And in memory of him and Lua Flowers, they were asking for donations to come back to, to uh, Stalker, and we got $250 from that. So we thank Mary in the memory of Tommy for that as well. So that brings our Stalker Youth Center Capital Campaign Fund up to $227,596. So we're, we're pretty proud of that right now. <laughs> um, Okay, now I'm going to get into the Enterprise Fund uh, balances for September. The Water Board had $324,198 in operating cash. They have $956,000 in CDs, and they still have a $1,081,000 remaining to expend for the uh, water upgrades through that the Atlantic Coast Pipeline is paying for. Sanitary has $416,000 and $113,000 in CDs. Waste Department has $610,000 in operation money and $57,000 in CDs. And the Consolidated Public Works Board has $93,500 in operating funds. And they have a cemetery CD at $227,000. Um, the Upshur County Clerk uh, called me and wanted me to let everyone know that they have the new voting machines up at the courthouse. If anyone would like to go up and see how those are operated, those are set up in the courthouse now. Um, sure. I was asked by the City of Weston to attend their meeting regarding annexation. They want me to talk a little bit about the success uh, uh, that I, I assume that Buchanan's had was working with the, the county and how if your city prospers, your county prospers and vice versa. Real quick question. Did they, did they say when that decision would be made? Because I know that do they have a timeline? No, uh, she told me she'd let me know when the meeting would be in November, and I don't know what when that is yet. Okay. You're welcome to go with me. Well, I was just curious. I was just curious. <laughs> I've been following it some, and I just I, I've been curious to know when they were going to the county commission is going to make their decision. Yeah, they want to annex the some of the southeast part. We're going Back towards this Walmart. Way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, towards Walmart. Uh, of course, you heard last evening the Police Civil Service Commission conducted their promotional testings for Officer Wilson's and O'Connor, now Corporal Wilson and Corporal O'Connor. And uh, just a heads up, now when, when, when that happened, they get a 25 cent per hour increase for that. Um, I answered three FOIAs that are in your packets, um, minor things. They, they was uh, about properties and environmental issues. If you have details about them, they're in here and I can answer it, but it's just kind of the basic things they're asking about storage tanks and if, if they have any building inspections. And then I had to send uh, one company our purchase orders that we've had since uh, June of 2018. Uh, in the bills to be approved, there's just a few that I'll note to you. $3,000 to the police academy for the tuition. Uh, we pay expense $7,600 to PTS Solutions, that's the uh, police department software. We expend the $10,000 contribution to Country Roads Transit. And I told you this the last time, we had 21471 that went to the CBP this time for their portion of the hotel motel taxes. And I think that's the largest check we've ever expended to them. Um, but the only other thing I can tell you ahead of time, there, there is a corrected budget revision in there to save time later. I'll tell you what that's about. I gave you the budget revision, but I didn't put some numbers where they should have been. So I didn't feel comfortable in just changing that. I'd like you all to see what's on those actual budget revisions. It's from the uh, Land and Water Conservation Grant, and it's for the extra, the added uh, grant funds, and you contributed your share of that 50-50 match for security equipment, sidewalks, resurfacing and of uh, the basketball court and bowl yards at the North Buchanan Park. 
the total grant with your share is 42,853. And you um, contributed 6465, 6,465 to that for matching funds. Since she's right here, can we just go ahead and do that since we basically already approved You don't want anything left for strategic. No, I don't. I'm right now. <laughs> so uh, your motion is to uh, pull F1. F1 to the table. Uh, yeah. Is that your motion, Mr. Yeah. Well, well, while Andy's up there, yes. That's uh, what second to his motion? Second. Second by Thomas. Is there discussion on that motion? F1 is now on the table. Uh, well, assuming you approve the motion. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, like sign. F1 is now on the table. Uh, the motion is to approve budget resolution 2018-23, which is in your packet, uh, and we know what it's about. Is there uh, a motion that we approve this resolution? So moved. Mr. Skinner, may I have a second to his motion? Second. I have a second by Mr. Thomas. Discussion on the motion? Roll call. No. We'll call for the question. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, like sign, and as is keeping with our resolution uh, format. It's a roll call vote. Mary Albaugh is absent. Mr. Skinner? Yes. Mr. Rylands? Yes. Pam Capari is absent. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Rigger? Yes. And the mayor votes yes as well. So be sure to sign that before you leave. Anything else, Amby? Any questions for Amby? All right, Amby. We'll bring Matt Gregory back up to let him finish his report. Just a couple additional things, Mayor. Uh, Today, uh, our very own Steve Wyckoff, uh, who has been our VIPS coordinator uh, since the founding of the VIPS program in 2014, uh, was honored with a Jefferson Award uh, at the WDTV station. Uh, this is in recognition for Mr. Wyckoff's uh, service uh, through the VIPS program. Uh, and as I stated in the packet, the Jefferson Awards Foundation is a nonprofit organization that recognizes, inspires, and activates volunteerism in public services, communities, workplaces, and schools across America. Uh, the Institute was founded in 1972 by Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis, U.S. Senator Robert Taft Jr., and Sam Beard. And so again, Mr. Uh, Wyckoff was recognized by Ontario Research Sources and the WDTV station live on their noon show. And I couldn't be more proud of Mr. Wyckoff uh, his contributions to the program and just the program as a whole. Uh, we have some very dedicated volunteers uh, who serve this program, who serve the city. Uh, in, in fact, the membership is up to uh, 14 now. And I, I do attribute a lot of that to uh, Mr. Wyckoff's dedication, uh, his uh, commitment to the program, as well as all of our volunteers' commitment and dedication to the program. Uh, just a couple other uh, addition to that, uh, just a couple of other uh, Halloween announcements uh, for the uh, police department. Uh, we will be holding our uh, third annual trunk or treat event at the public safety um, complex parking lot uh, Tuesday, October 30th from 6 to 8 p.m. Once again, we'll be partnering with uh, other city departments, fire departments, um, uh, other organizations, businesses, and groups throughout our community uh, to, to have this event. It's been very successful in the past. We've seen everywhere from five to 600 children uh, come down, and it's a really good time. So again, that is Tuesday, October 30th from 6 to 8 p.m. And along with that, to coincide, uh, we will be conducting our annual Halloween safety program for the school children uh, in our community. We see about 500 kids for this event as well uh, as we go out to the schools talk about safe trick-or-treating. Uh, we take uh, 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 some goodie bags to them that has uh, uh, different, uh, uh, the bag itself, a coloring book that talks about Halloween safety, uh, some stickers and pencils, and, and uh, uh, just get to meet a lot of the youth and get to share this event with them. So that'll be going on the week of Halloween as well. And uh, that is it. One other thing uh, uh, with my report, uh, which is attached, uh, as you know, I've been, uh, uh, augmenting it a little bit with CLIA standards. There's one other uh, augmentation that I just wanted to point out. Uh, this was actually in the report last month, and 
Um, I, I forgot to point it out, but I do want to make sure that you see this. I'm going to make sure that these are part of the monthly reports from this point moving forward. Uh, but that is uh, the page that begins with uh, Academy Resources. This is the uh, report that is filed on a monthly basis by our pro officer, uh, Sergeant Mark Stewart, uh, who is the pro officer for Buchanan Academy Elementary School. And as you see, it just uh, notes uh, all of his activities uh, throughout the particular month. In this case, it's the month of September. Uh, one thing to note is uh, Sergeant Stewart was um, successful uh, in obtaining grant funding uh, for a program uh, talk, called Too Good for Drugs that he's been taking to each of the classrooms and sharing with the students. And, and so um, uh, the recognition that he had received uh, statewide uh, was due in large part to his efforts uh, in getting programs like this in the schools. So I just want to make sure I point that out to council as well. Thanks, Ryan. Be sure to tell all the guys to be extra safe out there. Crazy things happening all over the world. We're not immune from the craziness. Any questions for Chief Gregory? Uh, Chief, in, on the report here, I have uh, I have uh, Miss Joshua Wilson. I guess the gentleman that was advanced to corporal this evening. Yes. In the, in the he must have been off duty for a while because he he only worked eight days. At least in the from yeah. 921 to 929, but he was also wrote more tickets in those nine days than all than uh, the, any of the other policemen. Yeah, he was and, activated on uh, military leave. And I noticed on three of these citations, they're for speeding 10 miles an hour and under, which I know we've had conversation in the past that there's kind of an unwritten uh, standard that you ticket people over 10 miles an hour and kind of warn them under? Yeah, what you're probably recognizing, uh, if we would look at the hard copy ticket, you would see that their actual speed was actually higher than 10 miles an hour over the speed limit. And uh, the reflection of the report is a use of officer discretion lowering uh, the speed limit from the actual clocked speed to a lower speed. And a lot of times that's due to uh, um, a difference in fines that you would see in the municipal court. So by utilizing discretion and lowering the speed, uh, you would see a lower fine for that individual than if he wrote that individual for the actual speed that he clocked them at. So it was uh, kind of a uh, giving them a break, so to speak, Absolutely. instead of giving and the actual speed to, to say it was somewhat under. And I've often said this, even if an officer writes a ticket, a lot of times, uh, if we just look at the, the raw numbers and, and make judgments on raw numbers, a lot of times we're missing the, the bigger picture. And the bigger picture in this case is, uh, even with a, a written ticket, there's still, in, in many cases, use of discretion. Apparently he's the only one that is utilizing that act's discretion in reducing it to under 10, but just an observation. Anything else for Mike Gregory? Thanks, Chief. Tell the guys to be safe. Okay, I apologize. Is Shannon Lewis still here? Yes. I apologize. <laughs> That's okay. This guy's elbowed me a couple of times, and we get onto another role. <laughs> you want to talk about wilderness night? And I, I, since you weren't on the agenda, I just didn't look at the show. That's okay. You want to tell us about wilderness? Night? Um, my name is Shannon Lewis, and I'm the assistant principal at Buchanan Academy Elementary. And every year. Our title, we are a Title I school, we host four family nights. And the most popular night that we have is Wilderness Night. And what this night does is brings over 300 of our students back to school in the evening time. We feed them and their families supper. And what we do is have um, various activities that the families can do together to encourage that family to participate in these events to do good old traditional family fun. Um, I did bring some flyers, so if anybody would like to see them, I do have them for you guys as well. And you're welcome to come. We offer um, the archery with Russ Warner and air rifles. We have um, the snakes from the DNR. They come, the kids get to hold the snakes. The DNR also brings their fish. They have knot tying, casting, different activities that they offer through other events they bring to our school. We roast s'mores. We actually have a fire pit. The kids actually hold the stick. They roast the s'more themselves. Um, we do have a bass boat coming. Uh, Jared Harmon is a, a fisherman around who does a lot of tournaments. So he brings his bass boats 
and the students get to climb up in the bass boat, put on the life vest, sit behind the steering wheel and see what it's like to sit in that boat. Um, Boy Scouts come to this event. We have a taxidermist coming to talk about the different types of ways that he can, that he does his animals. We also have somebody this year bringing some furs because a lot of our students are from the rural area or their families they hunt. So this year we do have some people bringing furs and some traps so that the kids can see these are activities that you can do or here's how you identify these type of animals. Um, we are offering this year some trail mix and you know the chips and sandwiches and that type of thing. But the whole idea is to get the families out together and to get them to do these things as a family, get their kids back to school after hours. Um, what we are asking is we would like to do a hay ride this year to get kids that maybe have never been around hay on a hay wagon to see what that's like. And what we would like to ask is that the street be closed from Victoria down to the board office parking lot. We are, our proposal is to come out and go down Victoria into the board office parking lot and then back up and come back down Smithfield back into school. And we would also like the um, Smithfield Street section behind the school to be closed as well. What day is your event again? Um, it's Wednesday, October 24th, and it's from 5 to 7. I had called and they, I didn't realize that Public Works did it versus City Council. Yeah. And so she asked me to come. If not, we will make an alternative plan with that. It's not technically on our agenda even for Council to take action? It's on the consent Yes, it's on the Is it on the consent agenda? Or you are in luck, Mr. <laughs> Under uh, E4, folks, uh, is the uh, event request. We'll take that up in just a couple of minutes. I can't imagine that this bunch of nasty fellows would say no to you. If not, we will reroute. I, I think, I think it's all going to be fine. If you let us take that up as the consent agenda here in just a couple of minutes. If you guys would like a copy of the yeah. flyer, I have one for each of you. Well. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Jerry, you also signed up. Do you want to wait until we get to the drug sure. ordinance? Is that all right with you? All right. I'll give that to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. All right. And, Amby, I got a check from uh, Mr. Rigger here for Staggered Youth Center. And six weeks ago, I sang George Jones on a dare for $1,200, and he's paid his bet. Right anyway. Hey, gambling and city hall here. Wait a minute. <laughs> He'll never, line. he'll never pay you every single gig. I promise you that. He's had one gig in his life, and now it's paid. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a professional singer. It's a true story. Tom, I'm on your side of the time. desk. I'm just going to defer until until you get down to the the goods with all the new stuff. Okay. Correspondence and information. Good grief! You got a whole bunch of stuff in your packet. There's a notice of public hearing a proposed adoption of an ordinance of an amendment to the city's home rule plan concerning the. Uh, sales tax. There's the uh, Municipal Home Rule Pilot Program Amendment application. There are three different FOIA requests that uh, Ambie had mentioned uh, to you. Uh, there's a letter from the BU Chamber of Commerce uh, respecting the B&O tax reduction as part of our sales tax implementation. Um, there's a PR statement from the school systems respecting the federal safety and security grant. There is uh, the Western Alcohol Beverage Control uh, Association uh, Commission's zoning form regarding fat tire cycle and adventure supply. Buckhannon Volunteer Center newsletter for September. The city of Buckhannon hosting Western Municipal League. The scheduled events for October 25 and 26. That's next Thursday and Friday, folks. Uh, all of the Halloween events that we heard Matt and Callie already talk about. And uh, lastly, the City of Buckhannon, there will be a special building zoning tutorial session. It's also open to the public, so if you want to learn about uh, zoning and building and housing enforcement and all that stuff, uh, on November 7, that's a Wednesday at 6 o'clock, MBS says at City Hall. Is it City Hall or is it at the Community and Training Room? Somehow I had it in my head that it was at the Community and Training Room. It's supposed to be at the Community and Training Yeah, that's what I thought. It says it's City Hall. Well, Anyway, come on out for that, folks. Um, the consent agenda consists of five matters. Uh, an approval of the minutes of our last regular meeting of October 4. We would be approving our building and wiring permits. We would be approving the payment of the general fund bills. We would be approving the wilderness night that Shannon Lewis told us about a little bit ago. And also there's an event request for the Shakespeareans 
by Cannon. Is that going to be in the uh, Colonial Theater? Not perhaps. I thought that was going to be at your place. I'm wondering why it's, it's an event request. You want us to approve the use of your facility, I CJ? I didn't submit anything. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it on the sidewalk? Is there something about the sidewalk? <laughs> not that I'm aware of. I'm not sure what we'd be approving. Uh, is it in the pocket? Nothing's ever easier on this place, you know. Oops. But I don't suppose there's anybody here from Buchanan Community Theater to tell us what they're requesting. Is. I don't know, guys. At the Buchanan Opera House, meet and greet, following the show, party at Stone Tower. There's nothing about there is, there is well, a matter, there is a request for some use of the sidewalk in conjunction with that event. In front of Stone Tower in or in front of, of the Opera House? In front of the Opera House. Okay. So there may be some spillover onto the sidewalk <laughs> as part of the Heckle event. passerbys. Spillover. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, we know what our consent agenda is about. Uh, I would entertain a motion that we approve our consent agenda. So moved. I have a motion by Mr. Skinner. May I have a second to his motion? Second. I heard Mr. Rylands first. Is there discussion on that motion? So it's it's Victoria Street from It would be Elm. Victoria Street, just, yeah. Well, East yeah, Victoria. Elm, down to the parking lot of the board office. And then Smithfield to college. Yes. All right. And if you need. And it would only be that two hour block. Okay. Maybe we could have some VIPS coordination on that too, Matt. Is that something we could try to collaborate with? Yeah. Okay. All right, so the motion's on the table to approve the consent agenda. Uh, is there any further discussion on that motion? I'll call for the question. All those in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, like sign, motion carries. Down to strategic issues, and a lot of these we've already uh, done, guys. F1, F2, and F3. F4 would be the approval of the 2019 membership with the Buchanan Upshire Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I have a motion by Mr. Rigger. Second. I have a second to his motion. Mr. Thomas, is there discussion on that motion? Hearing of the need for none, I'll call for that question. All those in favor of the motion to continue being a member of our BU Chamber of Commerce, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, like sign, motion carries. Next up is Ordinance 428. This would be the first reading of the Buchanan Drug House Ordinance that we've been talking about for the last couple Never of months. Yes. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, thank you. Yes, I apologize for my uh, relatively casual dress. Ties plus slings equal misery. So I <laughs> forewent the... Uh, forewent you need one of those clip-offs. <laughs> you know, I haven't had one of those since I was probably in fifth grade. Um, let me read it by caption and then discuss. Ordinance number 428 of the City of Buchanan and an ordinance providing for the abatement of premises deemed public nuisances within the public within the municipal boundaries of the City of Buchanan. What you have before you represents the sixth draft of the drug house ordinance can, after following um, multiple discussions uh, in uh, the City Council meetings plus the Town Hall uh, plus uh, uh, Feedback received from uh, individual council members and uh, and the public. Uh, the the draft uh, in its current form reflects all of the changes that were discussed and requested at the uh, last city council meeting. Uh, the primary change, well, the first the, the first primary change. Uh, is in Article 1, and that has to do with the triggering offenses under the ordinance. And because there is some change there, uh, given the given the requested, or given the feedback that was received, I'll just go through those um, again. So instead of three elements, we've consolidated them down to two. The first element is um, is a little bit. There's a little bit more meat to it here. So uh, a public, a property, a, a premises will be deemed a public nuisance if, one, any of the following offenses defined in West Virginia are committed in whole or in part on the premises. Manufacture of a controlled substance, possession with intent to deliver, 
delivery of a controlled substance. And any felony offense established in West Virginia Code 61-2-2-10B, that is a reference, that is the code section that criminalizes any assault upon um, a number of classes of individuals, including first responders, but it also includes things like um, public utility workers, meter readers, and so forth. They're, they're all covered, they're all, that, that assault on those individuals are all covered in the same section of code. So we just, just brought them all in. Okay. Or any felony offense established under West Virginia Code Chapter 60A, which is the chapter of code dealing with drug crimes, uh, that are committed while in possession of a firearm. So that's element one. Element two is that the premises is used for two or, so two or more such offenses or incidents within a 24 consecutive month period. Uh, the provisions of this ordinance shall not be deemed to be applicable to any hospital, clinic, or residential drug treatment facility that is either licensed, certified, or otherwise subject to supervision or inspection by the state of West Virginia. That is the first uh, substantive change that was made uh, to the ordinance in it, the current draft uh, when compared to uh, prior drafts of the ordinance. The other has to do, um, the other arose from a discussion with our municipal court uh, judge, uh, uh, Ellen Eckert, last Friday. And that was a desire on her part. And uh, in fact, I found her concern to be well well taken that uh, it would be her preference that in the event a property is deemed a public nuisance under the ordinance that the court itself be the body to issue the order of abatement and not uh, the complaining officer. And uh, so that is reflected uh, in this draft as well, particularly uh, and to point you to um, that is in Article 2. Um, sub B. Upon a finding by the municipal court that the premises is a public nuisance, the municipal court shall issue an order of abatement, which shall require the defendants to take measures reasonably calculated to prevent the recurrence of the illegal activity. Other than that, the ordinance is in um, uh, otherwise substantially the same form as uh, the prior draft discussed uh, in this body. Point of question, point of order. We had had a discussion at the last meeting about including, for purposes of a first event, a letter being sent to the property owner. It's in there. Is it in there? I didn't hear Tom mention that that was included. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it, I believe that it is in there. In, in other words, we're, we're not going to surprise a landlord. Okay, this has happened two or three times, and we're going to uh, do this abatement order thing. They, the, the landlord would know that there is a first instance so that they can try to abate on their own the arising of a second instance. Yeah, upon filing a complaint, municipal court shall serve written as process on each owner of the premises. Their tenants already well, resident. That, that's under the that's order. Under the order. That's uh, well. That's under. That's that's after the second offense. Um, I don't, I don't see let me let me look quickly. I do recall that. I do recall putting that in here, but we were dealing with so many different drafts. Uh, we can clarify that with an amendment here on first reading, and it can yeah. still, yeah. That's, that's fine. So yep. if, if you'd like to entertain a motion to ensure that that's clarified and be pre prepared for the second okay. reading. Let's just, get it on the table, and then we'll discuss it. With, with the amendment of uh, any first event that would ultimately qualify for the two events that could yield an abatement order, we will... Uh, have served or send by certified mail, we'll have to identify the specific means by which the landlord would receive that notice. Uh, if we insert that, I would entertain a motion uh, that we approve on the first of two readings, Ordinance 428. No. I have a motion by Mr. Rylands. May I have a second to his motion? I will second it to get it on the table for second. discussion. I have a second by Mr. Skinner. Now, discussion on the motion. 
Mayor, you had mentioned putting in, and I have no problem if you don't, but you mentioned putting in with the possession of a firearm, and I think there was discussion about, oh, what about a knife? What that, about just uh, personal injury? Do you remember? You want to say anything? It says any felony offense committed while under the influence of so Which would mean if you... If you're committing a felony under Chapter 60A while in possession of a firearm. Which would include so. assault with a deadly weapon. Well, 60A is not... No, 60A are just drug crimes. I mean, you mentioned putting... What about a knife? What about a... Anything I didn't know if you wanted to add a firearm. I don't answer so. Yeah. That's up to you. I mean, it's drafted the way I was instructed to draft it. I mean, we can certainly amend that to include not just firearms, but any deadly weapon as, as recognized by code. The question is how... We're starting to Christmas tree this a little bit. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't have any difficulty at all, and I think we had, in the spirit of our discussion from the last time, we talked about any any felonious, uh, anything that could constitute a felonious assault, firearm or other weapon. So if we could add, uh, add that language to it as well, Tom. Are we adding that to the motion? Yes, the amendment? that would be that would be my my recommendation. So we need a motion to add to that amend, to the motion. To amend the motion. Well, let, let's 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 finish our discussion first, and then we'll come back and amend the motion. Further discussion, Mr. Skinner. No, well, I mean, I, Jerry was on the on the list to speak about it. I didn't know if you wanted to. Oh, I thought you wanted to say something. About no, I, 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 mo I seconded it okay. to get it on Jerry, the table so that we could discuss it. We'll, we'll hear from Jerry. Well, I'd like very much to address a couple of things. I've gotten phone calls or had discussions with other hotel motel owners. Um, the first thing that I want to know is, are hotel motels, bed and breakfast, and Airbnb still in this ordinance? We couldn't tell. And I don't know which edition I have. Well, it's it's any yeah, it, it, there's nothing it could excluding. Be somebody's house, right? Yeah. Uh, this any, is, any okay, so apartment. it does cover everything. All prices. Bars, restaurants, well, no. sidewalk. Well, it <laughs> covers premises where... Lodging kind of thing? And it's lodging. It's not... I mean, the intent of the, the ordinance is to address residential premises. Um, whether rented or owned. Right. Any exclusions? No. Well, well yes, the, uh, the, 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 the hospital, the ho yes, the hospitals, drug treatment facilities, and uh, uh, anything which are licensed and subject to uh, supervision and inspection by the state. Is the local um, tr center down here and the others in Buchanan, um, do they actually provide treatment? To I my don't knowledge, understand they are, why. To my knowledge, they're licensed. That's a licensed but facility. But they're not treating. They're not what, what administering they medications or doing things like that. Treatment wouldn't necessarily include suboxone and methadone. It's a, it's a, they are a certified uh, substance abuse treatment center. And the discussion about exempting them did that occur in a meeting that maybe I missed sure or did. something? Yeah. Here at the city council meeting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, well, a and, a, and a city council meeting as well. A couple of times. Yeah. So does that involve all property owned by them and the sidewalks as well, just as it is? Because we were told that if it happens in front of our sidewalk, whether we own the, I mean, whether the people are coming to our establishment or not, if it happens on the sidewalk, that's an abatement to us. We heard that, premises uh, were sidewalks. Public property? Yeah. Well, the sidewalk is a public right of way, but it is privately owned. But if it's not a, if there's somebody that doesn't live there, how do you, I mean, you can't, you can't evict somebody that doesn't live there. But if someone falls down on the sidewalk in front of my house, yes. am I liable? Well, yes, I mean, you own that property, yes. That doesn't have anything to do with application of the drug house. No, process. but I mean, that's, that's just the principle that you can you can own the property even though there is a public easement across it, right. and you cannot exclude people from that that public easement. Right. But in the case of a of an application of this ordinance, if a violation were to occur on a public sidewalk in front of a, a premises, I I really don't know what kind of 
abatement procedures uh, could be reasonably implemented to prevent future recurrences of the illegal activity when it takes place on public sidewalk. So I, I don't, I, for council's benefit, I, I would caution against um, falling into, you know, the, uh, the, the, I mean, we could think of hypotheticals, you know, all day, you know, long. I, I would just say, after having looked at uh, Huntington's, Martinsburg's, Clarksburg's, this ordinance is already so much further advanced with the verbiage than these places that have had these things for a couple of years. Uh, it, it's, it, and I did speak with, uh, with Martinsburg's uh, city attorney today because I wanted to ask him whether or not um, their ordinance had ever been challenged in circuit court. Yeah. And in the two years that they have, uh, they have had their ordinance um, in effect and uh, have been enforcing it, it has not been uh, challenged uh, in circuit court because um, the way it works in real life is that the bad actors um, move on. That that this is a, that this is an effective tool in, in cleaning up the, the public nuisances, and it doesn't. You don't have to. Um, you don't have to go to the mattresses in order to uh, to get the desired effect. Mayor, I'm not I'm not questioning the writing of the ordinance, but we are the ones that are going to have to abide by it, and there isn't enough detail in it to help me understand what it is all about. For instance, when it speaks of the premises, is that by the unit? Is it two times per unit per two years? Is it two times in the whole uh, complex, whether it has 30 rooms or 60 rooms or 10 rooms? What is the number that you all are looking at as far as that? That's one question. Another question is, does it apply to only the person in the room who is on the registration form as having rented that room? Mary, it doesn't apply to persons. It applies to the specific premises only. We don't care who the players are. It's the activity that occurs within those particular premises. So my understanding as to the way Martinsburg and Huntington and Charleston have done this, which isn't as which is way more vague than what we're doing here, that's the point. It's way more vague in these other places, is, is that it's just that particular unit. So if you had an apartment building, you got 16 apartments, and an apartment G is the one where this activity occurs. It's that unit that the abatement order would provide would, would apply to. Just that unit, not the entire complex. So if, if Z got a, one unit. If Z got one and you had and B got one. They both have to get two in 24 months. Yeah. Well, the lien would be on the entire property if, if you if you blew off the abatement order. The, well, the abate the yes. abatement order would only affect the particular unit. Right. If the abatement order was not com was not complied with, a third unit. Then then a a uh, then the city can bring enforcement against the property owner for failure to implement the abatement order, and that. Could then implicate the entire property, well, but fact, that's not. In but fact, you could implicate all property wheresoever owned by that particular property owner. Uh, yeah, because it's a because the because it's it a then becomes a, a judgment yeah. against the individual, Absolutely. which is absolutely like, that's right. Well, help us understand when people are brought to our door, either by a member of the public who finds them sleeping underneath a, a street light or by a Department of Natural Resources officer who brings them there at 2.30 in the morning. Um, some, of them are uh, some of them are intoxicated. Some of them are under the influence. And these are people who bring them and say, you really need to take this person in until well, the light of the day. Intoxication, intoxication or, or being under the influence does not trigger the ordinance. It's possession with intent to deliver. It's delivery. It is um, assault of a first responder, and, and with respect to possession, with intent, with exp uh, and delivery, and so on, if these individuals are being brought by, uh, by law enforcement, they're not going to be delivering people who are in possession of, uh, of controlled substances. That's, that's a judgment call because I was assaulted by one of those people. And that's what we're trying to say to you, 
there is more to this business than people who are doing drugs. And somebody who's under the influence of alcohol, Tom, can become as violent as a drug abuser as quickly. Sure. And so that leads to an assault, but it was somebody that came to us through another source. There's so much of this that leads to questions as to how we would be affected by it that we just believe that it needs to be better presented and have more questions answered. The assault, the assault against any individual doesn't trigger the provisions of the ordinance and the assault against a first responder or any of the individual named classes of people in uh, Chapter 60, uh, Article 2, Section 10B. However, but the first responder is sometimes the owner of the property who goes to the room to make the announcement. No, first responder in West Virginia code is a sworn law enforcement official, an EMT, uh, or firefighter. a firefighter, not, not any person who happens to be the first person on the scene. No, first responder is a defined term under the law. I mean, so it, any like law is going to be here. determined by no. prosecutorial discretion. What? I'm, so, I'm sorry. You're going to have prosecutorial discretion or I mean, the judge's exists. discretion. And if there's extenuating circumstances and they objectively are presented, then well, they're the, going to show the discretion. And frankly, the, the, this Article 1 is drafted the way it is after significant public comment that wanted to um, really narrow the scope of offenses which could trigger uh, a finding of property being a public nuisance at the request of property owners. And so now if the, if the, the countervailing request is to expand the scope of offenses which can then trigger liability under the ordinance, I and mean, that's a policy question for the council, but it kind of runs counter to all of the input that's been received thus far. My last question will be to please remove the stigma of the word drug house. I don't own a drug house and I don't condone a drug house, and it's never been identified as a drug house. And every hotel, motel owner that I spoke to was offended by that term. Tom, is and there an ordinance anywhere in West Virginia or in the United <coughs> States of America that you know of that doesn't refer to this type of ordinance as a drug house ordinance? I've not run across one, um, and I don't know what, I mean, I mean, I don't know what we would call it. I, I, you know, a local it, business it, it's, about the community. Well, no, but it only becomes a drug house when there are two incidents that meet the specific criteria of the ordinance within a 24 month period. So, so, I mean, I, I really, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure. I understand the, the well, objection. That isn't that. That's not the official. The, the heading on public here is an ordinance providing for the abatement of premises deemed public, public nuisances. nuisances. That's right within the municipal boundaries of the city of McCannon. And I think it's drug house. I mean, drug, drug, house, drug house is a nickname that has been applied assigned, to. The assigned term. Yeah. Yeah. And, it may have, and, and I may not, and I may be mistaken, I'm not sure that term actually appears within the language of the ordinance itself. So. I don't. It might have been in an earlier draft. I would tell you that I talked with Martin now the city, longtime city manager for Clarksburg, following up on Matt Gregory's discussions with uh, the uh, police chief in Martinsburg, Tom's discussions with the city attorney in Martinsburg. Martin House is the best thing they ever did. Well, and I would note also that, that Clarksburg has taken a, a much different approach, and they have created an entire regulatory scheme for any rented uh, residential uh, Properties that I that frankly I think would be um, I think if we were to I, I think if we were to draft an ordinance based on the Clarksburg model, um, it would have been viewed as uh, as much more um, intrusive yeah. and and uh, burdensome uh, because it has to do with registries and uh, and notices to the city and uh, filings and. And all kinds of things that that are not provided for, not required in this ordinance, or or in the Martinsburg model, which which we kind of called it. Any further discussion on this motion? I would like to just okay. add this. I know that we're down into the details of the verbiage, but 
I would just reiterate one last time that I don't believe that uh, properties are responsible for the behaviors of people in them. Um, property owners. No properties. <laughs> I mean, if the if it's the if the judgments on the property or the liens on the property. Um, and I don't, I don't necessarily believe property owners should be held responsible for the behavior of people inside their property, though we know that everyone here would take reasonable steps to eliminate, uh, not eliminate, remove <laughs> those types of tenants. Um, and uh, the one other thing I would note is that individuals who rent their houses are typically of a particular socioeconomic strata. Not all the time, but often. And individuals in that in that uh, particular category tend to be more exposed to these types of activities by and large, which almost makes me feel like uh, this is has the potential of targeting a particular group of people in the community uh, who rent to individuals in a certain socioeconomic category. Um, so I, I'm not going to debate the um, the verbiage and nomenclature and all the, the items in the in the ordinance, but I would just express my disapproval of the the premise of the entire ordinance. You don't think my that, final thing to say. You don't think that folks that have drug problems, as much as we've talked about the equal opportunity plague of the current drug addiction uh, epidemic, that uh, it, it couldn't happen in an upscale apartment. No, it absolutely Somebody could. Somebody rents a nice house. Uh, there couldn't be a we, we've, we've had that arise all over town. Sure. We've had drug arrests with people that live in I would just say it's more disproportionate. Neighborhoods. Well, I, I think you're probably right. I think I'm not, I'm not saying it's a completely, yeah. I'm just saying it's disproportionately affects a certain socioeconomic. From a legal perspective, the issue is whether that creates any kind of, um, you know, legal impediment or, or, or you know, unlawful form of discrimination, I'd say that this, this ordinance certainly does not do that. I'm not saying that it's illegal or discriminatory. What I'm saying is I, I just disagree with the premise altogether as a means of solving the problem. Well, one of the reasons you're against it is because it will, in fact, target folks of lower socioeconomic strata more than... No, I, I'm just saying the nature of that particular business, um, the rental business, I, you know, if, I don't have any hard data here, but if we would say X percent of rental properties in Buckhannon are rented by people with a, a per capita in, or a household income of less than this amount, it would be a large percentage. And, and I think that that's also the socioeconomic class that's most plagued by the drug issues. No, I'm not saying it's exclusive. So I'm just saying it just so happens that this particular type of housing that's only available, this is the only type of housing available to a lot of people in that demographic. And they also have this issue, which could create more uh, homeless issues. Uh, so I'm just saying I disagree with the premise. I'm not saying it's discriminatory. I'm just saying it's based on the nature of that business. I got I would remind the council, this initiative started at the request of our first responder agencies. J.B. Kimball, our fire chief, and Matt Gregory, our police chief, following up on concerns for their work colleagues and subordinates. That's what started this. And our further explorations, as we talked with Steve Williams, Mayor Huntington, and as we talked with the officials in Clarksburg and in Martinsburg, they all say that they've had tremendous success it's another tool in the tool chest in dealing with the drug epidemic. That's, that's the, the undeniable facts from our sister cities. So the motion is on the table. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. Okay, t time out just real quick. The motion is to approve on first reading with, but we added as a, as two, amended. Two, two, as as amended. Amended. Two, there are two amendments. The one would provide for notice Hello. on a first event so that the landlords would know that there is a first event so they can right. be apprised to take steps so that there isn't a second event. And then the second amendment, Tom? That is to... Anything uh, that could constitute a felonious assault. Well, to, yeah, to amend Article 1, Sub A, to include any uh, felonious, any, 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 well, I would say battery. I would say any felonious battery uh, 
or assault. As long as the word felonious is in there. If I push in like that, that's, that's not a felonious assault. Well, it depends on your. That's a felonious. <laughs> and can we, in the spirit of getting this in its exact verbiage form, can in the next couple of days we tomorrow. get this so that folks can process it and digest I'll, it? I'll, I will forward it to you tomorrow. For okay, sure. All right. And I've looked through this whole thing. I don't see anything. No, the term it, drug house, it, it but might I, have, it I see public nuisances time. nine times. It's on the agenda. On the agenda or some, yeah. yeah. I mean, as a short title, I mean, that's not. Like it's, it's what they're universally called. All right. Did we answer your question, Mr. Yeah, Sorry. thank you. All right. With those two amendments, uh, motions on the table with the two amendments to approve on the first of two readings, Ordinance 428 of the city. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. Aye. It's three to two in favor of the first reading. So we will take this up again at the November 1st meeting. All right. Mayor, is it possible to ask a question not on verbiage? Sure. Am I out of order? I just want to clarify, and you said a couple times, and I like that idea if it'll work, that if we would get an order of abatement, eviction, that we could, after a second offense, we could almost immediately, if I'm understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, almost immediately evict that person. Am I correct? You you could. By order of the abatement. We don't have to go through magistrate court. Well, you so. could go through magistrate court if you choose to, and if but, you chose to, then that would be deemed compliance with the order. It'd be at your option. But there, we could have been based on the city's order of abatement. My opinion is that you could, yes. So that's my next question. If we go through Maastricht Court, and, and we just had that situation recently, the reason I asked, the tenant just didn't move. And the time came and they were supposed to be gone, so I called the deputies. They came over and technically don't physically put them out, but they basically stayed there until they were gone. Yeah. And then, of course, we have the mess and the damage to clean up. Yeah. Yeah. Is that something I'm guessing now that our city police, if we evict based on an order of abatement, then we'll take on that same thing to come and so actually... Certainly anything that pertains to uh, municipal legislation, the ordinances of the city like can, and our officers are okay. always ready to enforce those. Absolutely. My only concern is the last statement. I'm really sorry that the homeless people aren't here, the homeless coalition. I am concerned, and I think the landlords have talked about that. You can take it for what it's worth. I think this ordinance will very possibly increase homelessness because well, maybe. we as landlords are going to be twice as three times as concerned. Here's the fact. The, the facility in Elkins that is a homeless shelter and the Mission Alliance place in Clarksburg, they have policies that say no no drugs. Right. You can't you can't have drugs. Right. So essentially what we're trying to do is elevate what the homeless shelters are already doing as a criteria for who they let in the place. We're just trying to make that community what? Oh, well, they hopefully will clean up. Yeah. Well, the, yeah, but there's and, and it's, place. The last thing we want to do is counteract the, the good mission that we've advanced the last couple of years in other ways that we're trying to help drug addicts. We, 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 we continue to see that as part of the solving of this puzzle. And boy, it's, it's a tough puzzle to solve, I can tell you that. I, I think it just bears worth mentioning that the, the purpose of the ordinance is not only to um, enforce drug laws through this, this measure, but to protect the rights of the other property owners in the neighborhood that have a right to have their properties free from the public nuisance of having chronic drug activity taking place on neighboring properties. Absolutely, absolutely. Think of yourself as having that place right next door to you and you can't do anything about it. That's what this is about. Thanks, Tom. Okay, next up is uh, F6 which is Ordinance 430 on residential parking around West Virginia and West Lake College. First reading. Tom, you want to This, uh, this that ordinance uh, is in the exact same form. It is unchanged from the version that was presented in draft form at the previous uh, council meeting. This provides for uh, two-hour parking only within uh, or on four particular streets that are adjacent to the uh, West Virginia Wesleyan campus. 
Um, those streets are College Avenue between South Florida and Mead Street. All, all of each of these streets between South Florida Street and Mead Street. College Avenue, Barber Street, Fayette Street, and Pocahontas Street. We had room that, <laughs> that, <laughs> that the, the ordinance provides for the issuance of that designation of those streets as residential parking only, uh, and that any vehicle, any motor vehicle parked uh, on those streets between the hours of 8 a.m. and 4 p.m., Mondays through Fridays, except uh, state and federal holidays or any other uh, date determined by the city, by, by the city council, by motion, uh, would require the display of a residential parking placard. The ordinance provides for uh, the number of placards that may be issued to the owners uh, or residents of any particular lot uh, on those streets, as well as their uh, expiration, their renewal, um, their replacement in case of loss or theft, um, and it provides for a uh, violation of, uh, of the parking ordinance of $25 fine uh, for violation. Do you want to read this by caption and get it on the yes. table and we'll entertain a motion? So ordinance number 430, 430 of the City of Buchanan providing for resident-only parking on certain streets in the City of Buchanan in the vicinity of West Virginia Wesleyan College. You've got a misspelling on this, What? What? B-I-S. Are you serious? Yeah, B-I-S. Oh. Yeah, I well, I'll fix that in the amendment. That'll be we'll just technical cleanup. That's what we call it. Now, um, uh, in the vicinity of West Virginia Wesleyan College, providing for signage detailing residential parking only, establishing penalties, and providing for enforcement. This is the first of two readings. I would entertain a motion that we have a motion by Mr. Rieger, and I have a second to his motion. Second. I have a second by Mr. Skinner. Is there discussion on the motion? I would tell you that I had uh, a fair length chat with Scott McKinney, our vice president for finance at the college, and he uh, applauded the council's uh, changing the language from the previous drafts that he thought were a bit overly onerous uh, against college students. And I explained to him that uh, Dr. Reese probably wished we were back with being too onerous on the college students, but we, I think we all agree, we, hopefully we all agree that this is, this is something to try for a semester. Let's see where it goes. And uh, it's not like we can't revisit it next summer if uh, come May we say, oh my gosh, that's the worst thing we ever did, right? Let's see, can we revisit any ordinance at any time? Absolutely, absolutely. Is, is the parish house still experiencing some issues? They, do you know? They, uh, they, they want, here's, here's the problem with the parish house. They, they want more uh, two-hour parking and more handicapped parking spots, and they've already got like four of them uh, on the street. And uh, I even looked at it the other day from the perspective of maybe we change which side of the street you could park on by the parish house to get them closer to the parish house, but then you'd have to do the whole block all the way down, all the way down Sedgwick, Sedgwick, all the way to, all, yeah, all the, way to the library. Why don't we park them in front of Dr. Reese's house? <laughs> <laughs> Shuttle them. Uh, Uber. <laughs> you, you're going to get beat up in the parking lot after the minute. I deserve it. That's fine. <laughs> okay. So uh, any more discussion on the motion? Uh, we have it on the table. All those in favor of passing on the first of two readings, Ordinance 430, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, like sign. Motion. Okay. All right. Um, Tom, you're next up with Ordinance 431. While we're on a roll, this is our home rule amendment. Uh, ordinance 431 is, a, uh, is, it is an amendment authorizing the submission of the proposed amendment to the uh, Home rule plan. This is not. Um, this amendment does not deal with the elements of the plan at all. It is simply like we did when we dealt with the brunch bill uh, 18 months ago. It simply authorizes the submission of the uh, application yeah. uh, to the home rule board, and uh, uh, it would. Uh, we are set for a public hearing on the proposed uh, plan uh, for November 1st, which would also be second reading of 
this ordinance, uh, following uh, if it were it to be adopted, uh, then after 30 days, uh, Mr. Mayor, you would be authorized uh, to file the application with the Home Rule Board. You want to read this by Captain? So I will. Ordinance number 431 of the City of Buchanan, an ordinance authorizing the submission of an amendment to the City's Home Rule Plan to the West Virginia Municipal Home Rule Board. It's the first of two readings. First of two readings. We take it up again on second reading, November 1st, if you approve it on first reading tonight. We know it all has to do with the uh, endeavor to enact a sales tax. I entertain a motion that we approve this. So moved. I have a motion by Mr. Thomas. May I have a second to his motion? Second. I have a second by Mr. Skinner. Discussion on the motion. Hearing of the need for none, I will call for that question. All those in favor of approving this ordinance on the first of two readings, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, like sign, motion carries. I would note, uh, Ms. Frank, the, the contents of the application are subject to finalization following the public, uh, the public hearing on November 1st. That is, the draft plan, the draft amendment application that is has been available to the public for uh, more than two weeks now is, uh, is just that, a draft uh, that we are required uh, by uh, state law to make available. Um, this, the, the council is not bound to the current version of that draft, but can modify it uh, based upon feedback received at the November 1st public hearing. And, uh, and then this ordinance will then uh, authorize the submission of that application. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Tom, this doesn't state. It says, well, providing for the reduction of the city's business and occupation tax receipts. Yes. It's not specifically identifies the modification. No, we don't. This, that's after when the public the hearing. Plan, right. The, when the application to the Home Rule Board is submitted, that would need to have the specific proposal contained in it. This ordinance is simply authorizing the uh, submission of the application at such time that it is uh, in its final version. And understand, ultimately, there will be another ordinance that will specifically establish the details respecting the sales tax while also reducing the, uh, the B&O tax. B&O receipt. And, and with respect to the, to the BNO, I, I think it bears mentioning one thing. Um, to go this route, the city is required to uh, to reduce uh, its BNO tax. The code does not require any particular minimum amount that it reduces its BNO collection. So the idea that there is some minimum amount, there is no minimum amount. Uh, the minimum amount is something. Yeah. It is, but it is not set out in uh, in code, and that reduction uh, can take many forms. It can take the form of an increased exemption. It can take the form of increased rates. It can take the form of some measure. As long as, in my opinion, as long as the um, receipts are reduced uh, under the plan, then uh, we've met the burden under the code. There is no particular rate uh, reduction that has to be in the that, That's still a subjective decision by the Home Rule Board as if we met there, even though there's no stated threshold. That's right, but if we, they, if so we look at uh, other, other municipalities, municipalities that have been approved, they've been precedent. Yeah. But I'm told by those who know, because some of our municipal brothers and sisters serve on the Home Rule Board, that the Home Rule Board has never declined or denied an application that has the slightest amount of B&O tax reduction as a matter of practice. Did we approve the motion? I thought we yes. did. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, with respect to the uh, remaining items on, uh, on strategic issues, um, uh, according to Jerry, the, the, the deeds we are expecting uh, from John Moss and from uh, Davis Health are still outstanding. Davis Health, they allegedly have been executed, but I they've not been that. delivered. That's what I've heard that. Jer Jerry's, yeah, he's as soon as he, he's our point of contact with Davis Health. Well, well we're, we'll get there, right? Okay, thanks, Tom. Yes, sir. Any, any questions for Tom before we let him sit down?
comments and announcements. I want to hear all from Mary Allbaum Pam Capari. <laughs> Mr. Rollins, what do you got for us? Nothing. Mr. Skinner? Nothing. Wow, this could be quick. Mr. Thomas? Nothing. Mr. Rieger? No comment. I would uh, just remind the council that uh, it's a real honor to host the West Virginia Municipal Lake Board of Directors. Please try to plan on coming to that next uh, Thursday. The reception is at 5 o'clock. The dinner is at 6. The play is at 7. Or you can come with me and get the tour of Buchanan. You've probably don't know where that Stocker Youth Center is. I have never heard of half of yeah, these things. Yeah. So anyway, uh, you got an option when it comes to 7. Um, I, I want to reiterate uh, what uh, Ambie was talking about with the huge success of the elimination dinner and the uh, terrific gift from uh, Buchanan Toyota. Uh, it put us $30,000 closer to being able to realize our building. We deal with a lot of sobering issues when you, when you start talking about things like mistreatment of any group of people, when you talk about suicide, when you talk about homelessness. Uh, I wish it was all you know, sunshine, lollipops, and rainbows that, uh, oh, we built another sidewalk or, you know, we got another gift for the youth center or for the theater. But that's the uh, balance of uh, what this body is required to do. Uh, if I could have a short five-minute executive session with council to discuss a uh, property update, number one, and one uh, small personnel matter, Please. I would appreciate a motion to that effect. I have a motion by Rigger, a second by Rylands. Is there discussion on that motion? No decisions will be made. Uh, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, like sign. We'll take a uh, five-minute break and convene into executive session.